Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. We warmly welcome you all to the Green Talk conducted by the Green Green Council of Sri Lanka for the month February. Sustainable development ensures that what we are doing now is better for us, but should also help our future generations and an endless cycle should exist. A smarter use of natural resources will help our future generations. So green buildings are one of the examples of sustainable development. As the Green Building Council of Sri Lanka, we always look forward to improve and promote the built environment with sustainable practices with the vision to transform Sri Lanka's construction industry with green building practices and to fully adopt sustainability as the means by which our environment flourishes, economy prospers, and society grows, ensuring the future well being of our motherland. So, therefore, today's lecture is a very special topic for all of us. It is toward net zero green in construction industry. Actually, today, a special resource person has joined us to talk about this special topic. So, uh, actually, it is a great honor and pleasure to introduce uh, me, uh, pleasure to me, introduce him. Uh, so it uh, it was none other than the Professor Priyan Mendes. Uh, Professor Priyan, uh, sorry, sorry, I'll, I'll allow you to introduce. Sir. Professor Priyan Mendes is a professor in the Department of in Infrastructure Engineering, University of Melbourne, and the director of the ARC Center for Advanced Manufacturing of prefabricated modular housing and the leader of the advanced protective technology of engineer, engineering structures group. And he is a deputy director of the ARC industry Transform, transformation research hub, as well as he is the world leader in innovative construction methods such as prefabricated structures, tall building, durability of con concrete structures, advanced materials for construction, including waste materials, protective technology of structures, wind, earthquakes, and fire and blast. As well as he worked as a consulting engineer before joining the university in early 1990s. He's a member of the Australian Standard Committee BD2 and BD6. He was a member of the ARC College of Experts 2005 to 2017. Um, Professor Mendes obtained his PhD from Monash University, Australia, and he's also a member of several institutions. In <laughs> he's also a member of several institutions, including uh, institution, institution of Engineers, Concrete Institute of Australia, and American Constru Concrete Institute. And he is the founder chairman of Green Building Council of Sri Lanka. So I cordially invite Professor Priyan Mendes uh, to share your valuable knowledge on this session. Dear sir, over to you. Thank you very much. Um, thank you very much, uh, Sadipa, and also the uh, Green Building Council uh, of Sri Lanka for organizing this talk. Which I will go through um, uh, why we say this, and I know it's, it's a very hot topic now. Uh, Sunday, the world has changed, and last six months, especially. And it's been, uh, like the next few years, and to some few or more, we will hear a lot about this topic. This will be the, the topic people will be talking about. Even there are could be other issues, but this will be a, a, the a, a key. To. I want to just <clears throat> want to also mention a thank you to the chairman of the council, Professor Sandy Disanak. We saw a message from him, emailing all the way from Thailand while he was his on uh, other work. And also uh, Mr. Lionel, uh, Mr. Peksha, uh, the manager, 
uh, also, uh, and Sadipa, thank you to you as well, organizing this um, talk and everyone there, and also to the board of directors, some of them are here in this um, audience today. I'm more than 100 people. I didn't expect so many to join this talk today. Um, now, also, I had to, uh, there are others, I'm sure, but I want to uh, really acknowledge Mr. Darren Christie, who is a very busy person and a CEO of a company uh, joining all the way from Australia. Uh, and uh, it's very late here, close to midnight, joining today. And also uh, Dr. John Steele, uh, who is also uh, CEO, I'll explain uh, in when I mentioned their work uh, joining. There are others. There are many others so from Australia uh, and uh, like saying that they like to uh, listen to the recording uh, because it's very late here. Uh, but so I know uh, it's been rec recorded. So we will um, uh, make sure that they receive the, the talk. So without taking too much time, I will uh, really go to the topic uh, that I am really I'm going to talk today. And uh, just to make sure that I'm over the top of the one. Uh, yeah. Um, and I, uh, yeah, uh, I want to make sure that, uh, yeah, okay, I'll go back where can I, yeah, I want to, yeah, I'll just, uh, sorry about that. I just make sure that I get the full, full screen into this. And right. can you see my screen? Yes, yeah. Oh, yeah, sure. Thank you. And, um, it's again the uh, the topic I selected today is uh, towards net zero. Uh, we can talk for hours and days and all this, but I, I'm briefly summarizing the the important points today. And it is the construction industry which I will focus today. Uh, it's a key driver for all these uh, really the net zero activities, and will make a huge contribution towards reducing the emissions. Uh, there are certain reasons we all know, but I will be just touching on some of those reasons. The one on the right side um, is a building that we uh, actually, if I, we worked on it about probably 10 to 15 years back. Um, it's closer to Melbourne University and uh, it's only four stories, but we tried to, I was also part of the team, uh, really working on trying to, to make it to really experiment a lot of things. Uh, we put uh, uh, materials, um, again, the energy, um, really saving the, the solar panels. We even put the, my team even put some wind turbines there just to try it out. That's the time the wind type turbines in buildings were coming in. So at that time, uh, like, no, the interest was there, but not like now. But now it's really, as we know, the interest is huge. So it's really a requirement uh, that uh, we all know about it. And uh, again, the, the the amazing work that we're building Council of Sri Lanka doing uh, in trying to, to promote activities in this area. So uh, some of these are well known. Um, I ought to have to apologize um, in some of my, my, my talks in the YouTube and also some of the talks that I gave in recent trip uh, to other talks that have included some slides, but they are just general. And I will also uh, introduce some new information. There'll be time to ask questions. I'm sure it'll be an interactive session uh, later on. Uh, I don't want to take all the time. <clears throat> I'll finish a bit early so that, uh, we can uh, really, I can answer some questions. So we know that the pollution, we didn't care. It was like that before. And at the time, even, uh, I know there are a lot of younger people in the audience, but the time I was born, and at that time, uh, really like, no, there's not, nothing like that to say, stop emissions or reduce emissions. What we have been doing is just go and uh, pollute the, the world. So there's no restrictions as such. But now things have changed so much. <clears throat> These are real things. We know that the, the greenhouse gases go into the atmosphere, forming layers. Uh, there were uh, really uh, the, some people didn't believe, uh, but let's say even 10 years back, 50% of US population didn't believe. But now it's it's really amazing, things have changed. I don't see anyone now really won't believe the climate change and uh, because there are scientific evidence, which we all know, but I will. 
Now, this is happening, uh, this is for the National Geographic. Uh, it's really scientific available photos, uh, the glaciers uh, in 1913, uh, and then now, now 2012. So there's lots of evidence everywhere in the world, including Sri Lanka and other countries. Um, in Australia, we have a lot of evidence, the climate change, so it is all real. And uh, you have already, you already know about the greenhouse gases affecting the atmosphere. And uh, again, that uh, this ozone layer getting damaged. And uh, again, it's, it, it was happening in an alarming rate. What we all are trying to do now is to really, that's why you are here joining uh, this uh, talk, because you are interested in sustainability, you'd li like to do some you know, to, to make sure that the environment is uh, protected and for the future generations, especially. So this is a graph on the uh, 10,000 years. As I said, the, uh, the, the sustainability is, uh, uh, the, these are real numbers uh, being measured uh, before, uh, at, in fact, the direct air measurements before it came last uh, so many years, uh, before it, in 19, 80s it started or even slightly earlier to get the, the direct air measurements of carbon dioxide. Before that, it's through the ice cores. Uh, but we can clearly see it's going up an alarming rate, the carbon dioxide. And uh, this is recent information as well. Uh, the 2020 is going to about, uh, get into 420, uh, the, the, the past per million. So it's the, it's, it's really, uh, it's happening. What is the next slide? Uh, uh, yeah, so the mean temperature change, we know that the, uh, again, uh, if we look at that, I'll have a graph, it's changed. Uh, it's, it's again, due to this carbon dioxide and other effects, the, it's, it's changing the, the temperature. Uh, it's, Again, there are there is scientific evidence. It's nothing nothing people assume. If, if this one works, uh, this is from 1980 onwards, the world temperature map, and see what's going on there, and 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 different countries. We see where we end up in last year, where we are the the temperatures, uh, the global warming is real, and the Again, it's uh, uh, these are known facts. So it's going to, uh, I said, let's see why it happened. Uh, I'll just go, go to a bit more 1960s just to, to save time, 70s, 80s, and see the, the temperature uh, uh, map is changing, and especially last so many years as well. Say what ended up in 2000 last year, see how the, our map is. So it's, it's, these are real things happening. And if you don't do anything, uh, it's, it's uh, and again, this, this graph shows um, the different scenarios. If you allow this to happen without doing anything, then the, the graphs are, uh, again, the, the climate change, the, the temperature will go up at an alarming rate in 2100. In this case, it says five or six. Now, if you, that's why we are taking some action. I, if you take this action, uh, then um, then there's be no increase. Or we had to limit it to about 1.5 from now degrees, and then it, it's, it's we assume it's not. It'll go at a very small, very small rate of increase. So this is what what we are doing. So here on the x-axis and the temperature increase on the y-axis. So you can see we can take some action. That's why we are all talking like this. This other side is a very interesting book. If you have access to that, the Mark Linus wrote about six degrees, and people were laughing when you said this one. But it is really he's got facts there to say it can be even six degrees. That is there's some evidence already on that. And uh, I'll, I'll run through this. Uh, these are common facts. I'll run through quickly. Uh, we know things are happening. The climate change is really uh, allowing disasters to happen, the major disasters. It's one of the worst earthquakes in the world. So in 7.8 in 
yesterday in 7.8 in Turkey, Syria, what happened, you know, the really, um, again, it's a really terrible, it's up to 8,000 people, uh, like, so I think that that part of the Sri Lanka, quote, close Sri Lanka, it's the, the outside and floods there, extreme events, and um, again, the, the landslides, they are all increasing the number of natural disasters. They are all related to the climate change. Now, coming back to our topic before, so what's happening in the world now, in the next um, so many years, is this, um, this will be the discussion. And this will be like businesses as well. The carbon tax, uh, which I've been saying this for some time now, carbon will have a value and the carbon trading has already started. If you look at the way carbon trading sites are there, internally countries are doing as well, but, uh, but again, the, this will be a big business. And I, I, I don't know that I'm the first person to say this. I think in, now we are talking about 2030, um, the relay, 2030 emissions reductions, 2050. And my thinking is it'll be like cryptocurrency, which, which when it came, people will be crazy buying that and the increase in the price. So similar things will happen in, um, in carbon and, um, and we, we can't imagine, but in a few years time, that's my, my thinking. I think if I could be true there when I, when I say that. Now, the, the same time, the, the, what is happening in the world is to uh, have these carbon emissions trading schemes and the carbon tax. There, there's a carbon tax, there's a carbon figure. The carbon is worth money. So the, the carbon tax is in some countries, they put a real direct tax there. Uh, and these are OECD reports in the web, we can look at it and, uh, and the World Bank. Uh, and the other countries are going through what's called a emissions trading scheme that is offsetting the carbon. You can be a, a polluter, like energy company, which they can't really, really uh, net that. But what they do, they can uh, then offset their carbon. And I'll give a very good example, which uh, uh, in, in uh, closer to us. And the, these are average carbon tax rates is, is, is changing all the time and the carbon prices are going up. Carbon price is a way to restrict these emissions and UK has done it successfully. The 73% reduction in the emissions in electricity generation by increasing the carbon tax. So every country is doing it. And uh, now that's why the, it's becoming a very attractive trade for even um, uh, even a lot of people. This slide here, uh, it's, 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 as I said, it's midnight in, in around here, but uh, Mr. Darren Christie joining, and uh, the, he's the one who, who is doing this and really working uh, with me closely as well. Uh, and again, uh, I think Tassika in the audience uh, prepared this slide for me, You're also working closely on this area. The, with, um, with the hemp in construction, uh, again, Mr. Darren Christie is uh, really doing this in a big way. Uh, that is the hemp, the material, uh, there's some discussion in Sri Lanka as well. This is called, this is industrial hemp, uh, not, is, not the recreational type of uh, material, the, the plant that uh, being really, really wrongly categorized. This is just industrial hemp. Uh, the TCH levels are, very low, it's, it just can't be used as a recreational uh, activities. And uh, um, again, as I mentioned, um, this is uh, Mr. Darren uh, Christie who is in the audience doing this work, uh, like you now they're using that, separating the, drying this, um, the plant, uh, and then uh, the, again, converting into the fibers, uh, the, then the seeds are converted into uh, the again the uh, like you no know, cosmetics and many other soap and other products. So the, the again it's a carbon negative and it can be used in the chips can the other herd can be used uh, uh, the can be used for within with the um, the lime and so on and used for for 
or non-road bearing construction as well. So this is really a, a product which will you will hear a lot in the next few years. And the again the one acre of hemp absorbs. Um, thank you, Tosin. Measure 10 tons of carbon dioxide around that, and we are doing some more accurate calculations. So this is a good example of what's going to happen in the future in the, the construction industry or the energy where the, we, we can't offset the carbon. You can go and really, uh, really grow these materials. And it's, uh, I'm sure it'll come to Sri Lanka uh, soon. Now, in this case, uh, the, this, uh, the normal timber takes uh, so many years let's say 30, 40 years to grow, the, this is only three to four months. So it can be even done thrice a year, up to thrice a year. So the carbon absorption, you can see very quickly happening. So this is where the world is going in the future. And um, uh, started a long time back. And now it's really, a lot of people want, architects want this to be used, um, and panels to be used in, uh, in, uh, in buildings and, and obvious reasons. This is really a good alternative for that offsetting the carbon. Now, we all know the, the, the COP26 decarbonization goals, and it's really to keep the plus one glass uh, in five, um, uh, then to, re to keep it to um, 0.5. If we don't do anything, it's going to be a lot higher, as I said. And the human, uh, the it's the it won't we, we won't exist if it goes to six seven degrees. So we had to do something. Now, again, the uh, the in terms of the construction industry, my focus today mostly on the construction industry and the the construction demolition waste. We need to start looking at it, and this is what's really. Even in Australia, we haven't done everything yet uh, because it's the 40% of the total waste generation is construction demolition waste. That's the area you are here most because you are interested in the construction side as well. And this is something we all can start thinking to reduce that um, construction and demolition waste. That's a huge um, really step towards reaching our the net zero targets. Australia has uh, um, uh, like no compulsory now, idea is to bring gas greenhouse gas emissions by 43% and to total net zero by 2050. Many countries are adopting like that. So the, uh, the construction industry, the, the consume 32% of the world resources, huge. The, these numbers can vary here and there, but these are rough numbers. It's really the 40% of the energy consumption, uh, generate more than 40% of the waste material going to landfill. So that's why we, as in the construction industry, we can do a lot of things to correct, correct this. Now, the, the sustainable de development goals uh, really are the UN. That's all started from there, uh, the Nobel Prize and all that, and doing lots of service. We all are involved in that. Um, this is on the left-hand side. You'll see the construction industry can really contribute to number of uh, UN sustainable goals, almost all the goals in different ways. Because linked to construction industry is linked to people, environment, society, means all that. So because of that, we are really the industry, more than any other industry that can contribute to us that, uh, that the targets. And on the right-hand side, you see uh, the I thank Dr. Vijay Sokol and the group that Sanko Global um, now giving me this Leader of Humanity Award in um, was, uh, on January 1st in um, uh, the ceremony in BMICH. So uh, thank you to that foundation for um, recognizing my um, work, uh, to contribution to the UN Sustainable Development Goals. Um, now, with uh, today, my talk is also. Um, the also on the quantification, the importance of that. General things we started talking a number of years back, um, and um, we know that in 2009, since that, the Green Building Council of Sri Lanka exists, 
And so we started talking about it um, the, even at that time. Now, in, in terms of the, uh, the quantification is a key, which is missing the carbon matrix. Uh, thank you to Rashmi from CSEC here. Give me this slide, uh, the, like the, the for Sri Lankan context to calculate what would be the, uh, what would be the, uh, the reduction required per year, the carbon to really achieve some of these targets. So some of this quantification had to be done um, through my talk is today more, I need to, uh, uh, the construction side, so I will not spend time uh, going through this. But just to mention, uh, we hear all the time linear versus circular economy. Uh, so it'd be quickly, uh, really the, the, the show the difference there. The linear is that, you know, that that's what we were used to up to now. We use the resources, extract from the ground, produce, consume them, and just dispose to landfill. That's what we have been doing, and to, to dump them somewhere. Now, now the things have changed. Suddenly, we are all going for a circular economy. That is, we have the, 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 uh, the production, then uh, the consumption, the, then we manage the waste, and then we convert into secondary raw materials. We use the word upcycling. Now, upcycling, I know the, uh, the some of us used uh, so many years back now, is coming to the mainstream. The word upcycling, now we call it upcycling. So that is we don't, rather than just recycling a material, I may not have time to talk in detail today about every material. I'll have some general slides, but the, uh, again, the, that is, you can use the material and take advantage of the material. So the, the, the for example, like if you're using um, really, uh, let's say rubber also in, um, in, in construction, then it, got, uh, it improves the tensile strength, the obviously flexibility, deformation capacity. So you can improve the impact resistance. You can improve the, even for earthquakes, the, because deformation capacities, some of these materials, so you can make use of the positive side of it. And again, the, we know the fossilonic materials, we all used to fly ashes, slag and all that, replacing cement. Cement, as we know, is the biggest, uh, one of the biggest polluters. So we are replacing the cement. Every project now, we need to think, uh, the clients want it to be reduced. Those days, the clients didn't know, clients didn't care. They were just only caring about the cost uh, and if the dollar, uh, sorry, rupee value or the dollar value. But now the, the clients want this had to be, to be reduced. Otherwise the banks won't lend money to them. And to, this is really very serious. If you can't show your pro project is either net zero or else um, really working towards that offsetting even that carbon number, you can't get any, any loans in number of countries, including Australia now. So you need to really, uh, it's the clients are the ones pushing now. So it is a good thing for the world before it's all about cost. Anyway, so they want the, so you need to really reduce the cement content, for example, uh, using alternate materials, phosphorinic, we call it. If, it. if there are any questions, I'm happy to answer, but uh, not going to go into technical today too much on the, the that side. But uh, so replacing the materials and the, by alternate materials. So they will improve the properties. We know when we put, I ashes or slag and all that. It improves the improves the the the, the properties, and the, yeah. Um, so uh, the next slide. If I go to the next slide. Uh, so principle of circular economy. I'm just touching on this today. So uh, so again, eliminate the waste generation in the construction sites, pollution, and the circular um, the materials designed for reuse. Uh, today, I'm not going to talk about it. I'm, I've used the word, um, it's really designed um, for uh, really uh, the, uh, the design for um, the reduction in uh, carbon neutrality. Uh, so designed for that. So it's the, uh, from the design stage, we need to think about it, reuse the materials and also the eliminated use of some of the natural resources. Now, Today, again, I'm just touching on this today. What is this net zero uh, definitions? 
of the net zero carbon buildings. Uh, so uh, the, there are two types of energy. You will know embodied carbon on the bottom. You will see the uh, embodied carbon uh, at the bottom. That is the, uh, again, um, the, we can make these slides available, so no need to really read like smaller letters. Uh, uh, carbon as material in the, in the building, the operational carbon. I will come to the other, other additional ones as well, but especially in the building, embodied the materials as well as operational time, so electricity and uh, and and so on. So that is the so whole life carbon. You need to you can't just separate those two in a building. Uh, I'll skip this one. Uh, skip means I will run through very quickly. There will be different the different definitions will come. Net zero energy building, as I have mentioned here. Um, so 100 percent of the energy demand is made by the on-site renewable energy, which is not easy to get that on-site. So we can use the different alternative ways of doing it. Now, if the if it's important, uh, so it's not uh, we had to get some from off-site uh, to meet the balance, then it's net zero operational carbon. And if you include materials, all that, then it's net zero whole life carbon. So these terms, uh, like no people wrongly use, so uh, you can really have an understanding. Every company is going to have this carbon, footprint should be reduced by 90% and the remaining offset by carbon, uh, by um, net zero. I went to a function recently, they were saying all the carbon, they had calculated what is the carbon uh, uh, function here in Melbourne. Uh, the, the, yeah, they have calculated the carbon uh, on that um, event. And what they're going to do is some, uh, that some forestation, that plant some trees to offset that event. So. Everyone has to is trying to do something now, which is really to see is great. So this is what we probably could achieve. Uh, these are what we building, building council is saying is advanced in net zero. That is the uh, all operational carbon emissions to be reduced by 2030. Uh, so uh, reduce it or offset with other ways, as I mentioned. You can um, grow trees. You can wrote him for some, like you know, some of those the, uh, the activities you can do to really offset, reduce embodied carbon emissions by uh, like you no. Know, so uh, again, operational plus embodied by 2030. This one's um, like not being presented in the green talks and even I have presented, but there are ways of doing it. Um, the, there are so many things that we know uh, that we can do that energy efficient lighting, uh, the solar has come. It's really, these things have become compulsory now. The green roofs, the water efficiencies, the two sticks, the daylighting, natural lights, they're all covered in the, the, the green ratings. The Sri Lanka ratings are one of the best in the world in terms of green ratings. So I think it should be good to be familiar with that, how it's done. And the, some innovations now. So we need to include some innovations to really achieve this targets in our construction industry. So the one, one example is the, the, if the, we know the roof area in a building is not enough for solar panels to really compensate for that uh, uh, the energy. Uh, so it's um, really like you need to use facade panels. You need to put in the cladding, outside cladding, which has got a big area uh, to really, uh, really have that um, the, the solar effect like for the whole building. So to, uh, to compensate for the, uh, to, for the carbon. Now, so in this case, the, uh, the, the facades uh, like you know, can be developed. You will see a lot more in the buildings in the future. Uh, every building now they consider this facade integrated uh, PVs uh, where they will they, they'll use still a bit expensive. And the, now, I just want you to start thinking that this calculation, so we need to start calculating these numbers. So the, the construction emissions, now what is what we have not considered in the past is about the, the fuel and electricity construction stage. We have calculated, as I mentioned, embodied energy, 
with the materials right at the bottom. Now, evaluation and uh, to a couple of things we have not done in the past. We need to include that now. So that's the construction stage. So we also need to, con to consider things like quantify things like construction waste treatment. Construction pool, I'll have a couple of slides for alternatives. Construction pool, we, the diesel is a polluter. So we need to really to look at that. The, um, the alternatives I'll, I'll, I will mention in the next few slides. Waste, we need to really, we know that the whole of the waste has to be reduced. So uh, the construction equipment, so we need to quantify them. Electricity and also the construction equipment, plants, all that. We didn't do that before. So uh, to, we need to start really taking into account all that. And the projects, um, really, they have started to quantify these ones. And the, the clients need this uh, to get approval. You will need this, all this, the quantification. So one of my key messages today is to start putting some numbers, even rough numbers to start with. We have done embodied emissions, operational, I didn't include here, but embodied emissions, but what we have done is to really embody the energy of the materials after they are extracted and uh, brought, but also you need to think of the local materials. I know the green rating systems indirectly say 50 kilometers or 100 kilometers and so on. The points are given like that. The materials has to be sourced close by, so there'll be the transport uh, cost will be less. So the emissions in transporting the materials will be less. So we need to start all these numbers and like what we have done with the try to reduce the cost of a construction project. Now we have to start really, really uh, having solutions and calculations for the carbon numbers. So there's some guidance there today. I'm going to go in detail. One of the best ones that I see uh, the, is the, uh, the calculate the embodied carbon by the Institute of Structural Engineers. Uh, I think it's out by now. Um, now, it's very, uh, again, I will not spend time too much going through each one of these, the life cycle, uh, life, life cycle different stages. Um, what happened here? Sorry. Let's go to the next slide. Now, in this case, uh, what I wanted to do just to see is there are different stages. Production stage, raw material, uh, process, I mentioned. Uh, and time in the use of the building. Also, we need to start thinking about the end of life now. We can't just really think about the operation stage, build, building a, a like the construction and think about what happens at the end. Uh, countries like Singapore already have started looking at uh, really, the, you have to give a plan where after end of life, what do we do to all these materials? I will give a good example closer to me. Uh, we, are, uh, we are already considering the end of life things. So reuse is a word, recovery uh, of all the resources. So these sort of things will come and some of these documents are available. I will not go into detail, the quantification. Alternative fuels had to be used. This is a hydrogen plant I visited in um, 2019, uh, before, just before COVID. But, the, so the, the hydrogen is one of the alternatives, which really green hydrogen now is one of the alternatives being considered. Uh, we need to replace the diesel uh, on site. Uh, that's also will be, had to be compulsory now to be, to be doing that. Uh, and the biodiesel is coming in a big way. So uh, again, the, you can read about biodiesel, you know, get it from vegetables and other crops. And the, so biofuels are, becoming very popular now because of the carbon footprint uh, replacing the, the fossil fuels. The, again, the, uh, some of you have, may have seen this when I presented this, uh, this earlier, one of these case studies, where if you take uh, this particular building, and I will not read everything, that it's, it's really the energy side being covered with the triple and double glaze curtain wall, the, the cladding, and the HVAC system the, uh, is really the building service systems uh, is also key. Uh, energy efficiency rating is very hard to get that. I don't think should aim for this high. Um, so they have gone for 15 in this energy efficiency rating, so which is really quite high. Now, 
energy recovery ventilation, then the recover the cool air from the exhaust system, uh, then also the lighting system uses intelligent designs. So they have really achieved the, the one of the first to achieve the net zero operation of carbon in a building. You can read some of that um, uh, really material if you look at the way for, for this particular building in Manila, you get that, that information. This is closer to that. Um, thank you, Hashini from um, CSEC, BSEC uh, doing this work uh, to really looking at the, um, the Malawi building, the optimizing the energy performance, doing the calculations using eQuest type of tool and quantification is again the key and then suggest solutions to, to improve the energy efficiency. So that that be really the, the, in a, Will, will come in a come in a big way, and the, the again the uh, really modeling is is quite important. Like using tools like Revit and so on are available now. Using that, um, so that you can really do uh, uh, like on the improve the designs. That's the work by basic there. The the in terms of the the my work, which is really which I form this center about six, seven years back uh, with the prefabricated housing. Um, we, we sort of like now started to introduce in Australia at that time as a team with the, the, this center with the prefab boss type of group. Uh, now, the prefabrication module is a good example because now we talked about embodied energy in the material. We talked about the operational energy. Now, also now we talked about the only way to greening the our construction industries to to attack the construction methods as well so the we need to so this is one of the the key ones do many things on site so uh, that you can really reduce the waste uh, you can uh, really the energy you can optimize all that do it on site and then transport it uh, and then good if it's close by and then and then put it there so there are so many advantages there the, it's been to be done very um, very quickly. I had the chance to go to the ICC, uh, the SI, ICC. They invest a lot of money on uh, this modular and uh, not to have a plant. So uh, I think it's very very good step there. Um, so the this is rapid construction. Rapid construction is a key. Now we need to really reduce the construction time. We can't have two years. Uh, to do that, we can do it very quickly. So the do it in the shop, and then bring brought it there. So it's in there, there's a talk on um, prefabrication in the YouTube, uh, on international talks uh, under my name. You can search for it if you want more details about this. So today I will be really just touching on other advantage is the reuse. These modules can be removed and reuse it. Um, you may have heard something from the Qatar Stadium where. They use module and they just remove them and they transfer. Uh, it's really a good example where uh, the um, that you can reduce that carbon footprint during construction. So we can build quickly, cheaper, environmentally friendly, sustainable, high quality construction. I gave the name construction 5.0. Uh, we know we got industry 4.0, but why not we go to 5.0 in the construction. Dr. John Steele kindly actually, in fact, joining this, uh, it's very late, as I said, midnight, past midnight, but joining this one, the CEO of this RoboVoid, it's an innovative product. So these are the kind of new uh, products being introduced there. You can look at the LinkedIn side there um, of John's work. Uh, that is really a plastic, recycled plastic void formers, reducing the material uh, used Reducing the concrete in the in 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 number of applications and in, in that uh, rubber wall site you will see loss of information and the uh, and you can have um, again the uh, here John is putting reinforcement to really strengthen the jo the joints um, today we may not have time but I think uh, John is still still listening in this talk is there but. The, uh, so he's really doing a very innovative project in Mumbai, closer to uh, there to, to Sri Lanka, uh, started working on a project. So I'm sure this can be introduced 
Sri Lanka as well, some of that, the robo white type of innovative construction. Other things I will just touch on now, uh, the design stage. This is something they are with, uh, 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 like you know, Shomal also from C sector looked at it, but the so some of these, uh, the tall buildings, uh, how you can improve. So the reduce the materials. So you can use innovative design techniques. And the, and the, in this case, I, I suggested this for one of the buildings in Dubai at that time, the have some slots to really reduce the wind loading. So like that it's, uh, at that time it's purely for a cost and other purposes, but now the net car the carbon has come in a big way. So innovative design methods also key in our construction. Also, uh, I didn't touch on this. Now the clients want it to be about 100 years, the buildings, not 50 years. So that um, the your whole of life cycle, uh, the, the cost could be less. That is, in, uh, you can really improve the sustainability of the buildings by not 50 years, going to 100 years. Bridges and other infrastructure, they're always on 100. But, um, but now that even buildings, we are going to, to be 100. So this is very quickly on the net zero work, uh, the quantification work uh, uh, from, I you see a lot more because Green Building Council has selected this as a pilot study, actually working on this uh, with the Green Building Council team uh, to really look at the, how net zero concept can be adapted to a, a case study there and some of these quantification, uh, really actual values being calculated by a program like eQuest or Energy Plus, and then, um, then really comparing that with the monthly energy consumption bills. So this you will see more and more in the future, and Green Building Council has really um, have a very good document will be released on, on all this, and the, this is built to the, one, the pilot study for that work, so I'll not go through in details, but quantification is a key for, for that. And the solar PV, uh, PVs are there in the building to really offset some of that, uh, the energy energy generation. See, the, 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 again, that you can see the energy, the, the bulk of that is offset. So very quickly, some of the work on recycled materials, just to uh, touch on this, uh, the, uh, again, the, Waste materials are a key for any construction project, whether it's a building or a, uh, in, uh, other infrastructure type of project. So there are drivers now, policy drivers are there. Uh, and then we are talking about end of life. Uh, carbon credits are being introduced, as I said, it's going to be a big business now, trading carbon in the future. Uh, then Australian carbon credit units, we have been introducing Australia, other, all the other countries are doing it as well. So we can read about some of that um, methods. There are barriers for us. Procurement, to pass it through the regulatory authorities you need to go through some of the materials. We are allowed to still only use some of the materials only for uh, the soft application. Also. So this is where there's a gap now. That is, we want to make it to work in the, the load bearing type of high level applications. So we need that uh, evidence base, the field applications, scientific evidence base. That's why the research and innovation and collaborations with the industry and the uh, researchers and others uh, are required innovate, innovations and so on to really provide that scientific base. This is an example where uh, the CSEC building, the, the slabs um, have been cast, uh, to, this is last year, uh, the, uh, um, the, the all the type of waste materials have been used in the, in, in one of the, the, the ground floor slabs, the plastics, rubber, the crushed glass, bottom mesh. Uh, uh, again, if there are questions, I will explain the textiles and also hair, human hair has well been used to really um, to, so any material can be used with concrete. So, but concrete is not a dumping ground as well. We shouldn't treat it like that, but concrete is where, we can really effectively use number of waste materials so to reduce that uh, carbon footprint. That's the work to really uh, um, on the graphene side, which really flows to Sri Lanka. Graphene is a wonder material, um, the 2D uh, structure there, uh, 
Now it improves the strengths, compressive strengths to all aspects in the, the concrete. So it's more than all the performance is there, but it reduces the embodied carbon. I'll explain why. Sri Lanka has the, the purest form of graphite in the world, the vein graphite, uh, and this is the uh, CGT um, the, uh, with LOSC CGT uh, venture uh, with the, the plant in the world to do this the cheaper way of doing things. And um, see there, I will not go through in detail. Thank you to Sita for this, uh, um, for, to for, for providing me this information with the calculations. Embodied carbon on the y-axis. So in here, the philosophy he has used is that 32 MPa concrete has a certain amount of cement, but when you put the graphene oxide into this graphene oxide, the water soluble, it's a huge water solubility, easy to use in construction. You'll hear a lot more there in the future. Um, so we're doing lots of research on that, trying to introduce in practice, not just lab in the field. So the cement, is reduced. Because of that, you get 40 MPa. And see here, so the embodied carbon is same. So by adding that material, so there's a reduction in the embodied carbon. So these sort of innovative materials will come in the future. On the right-hand side, you see some calculations, or maybe I can go to this one, the, this, this calculation for that uh, chart. Again, uh, thank you for this information. The, with the, see the cement, Gram of cement. But if you use fly ash, and we know it is very little use, but so it's a very, in this case, the carbon number is very small. Why you add in that? But you have a 25% reduction because the, 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 the cement reduction is there in that. So you can, you have to get used to, uh, to these um, calculations now. There's the uh, Institute of Civil Engineers London database. If you look at it, you can get these accurate numbers if you want to do the quantification for these, um, the, the, the additives, the phosphoric admixtures, and so on. A bit more accurate numbers there in that IC database. It's uh, really downloadable from the, the web. So you can really look at the quantification, is had to be done. Some of the other materials, the you can use the construct and waste. Uh, we have to start thinking now, what do we do when you demolish a project uh, the, and then recycle concrete aggregates are a, a good example, can be used uh, very easily in practice. The bricks can be used and so on. So there are some projects we are doing all aspects of waste materials. We've got different projects, um, really solar panels. What do we do with the solar panels? We didn't think about it, that we replace in about 10 to 15 years. And recently there was a cyclone. The, so it's in a couple of years, the solar panels got damaged and to be replaced. So what do you do? We have a major project, uh, I think Mr. Uh, Niraj Das, who is, um, he wanted to join, but as I said, it's midnight. He wanted to listen to the recording. But like that, they, he's working with us on trying to recycle these solar panels, the glass, um, and then we have used glass in a, real project, a tunnel project here. That is the, the thing. The lab, you know, as you know, academics are, all that we can do work in the lab, but put it into the field is a difficulty. I will not spend time today. The major difficulty working with, uh, with Holcim in uh, Australia is, was that we identified the, it's even the glass damages the pumps. So that, this sort of thing, but otherwise it's fine. Glass has another problem, which I will not talk too much technical today on that the ASR, alkali silica reaction. So it could damage that. So we put a bit more fly ash to reduce that. So glass can be used. The waste glass we're talking about, waste tires. Now, because of the, the China ban, we are now, uh, we can't export it to China. So we need to, as Australia has really introduced a very strict legislations. And I know even Sri Lanka, this can be used and other countries in that part of the world. Um, um, and then again, I got some text from India as well that I think um, it could be probably, they would like to listen to the recording. They could be even here, but listening. But so again, that these are things that had to be introduced in other countries 
the and the, we are even working on textiles. We are putting paper into concrete, so uh, as well. So this is the uh, the yeah this one I mentioned about the project. We put it into a, the metro tunnel project in one of the biggest projects in Australia uh, to really for temporary slabs. Still, we are looking at load bearing panels later on. We use a specific special called vortex process to process the glass. Even the dirty glass can be put in. But I also want to know what Nikas what what microns we push up to that to uh, really put this material. Other work we are doing is when we break it into smaller pieces, we think there will be some porcelainic properties. So that cement can be replaced with it as well. So that work is continuing as well. So it's really application in, um, this is one of the first for a large project uh, in the world. We can apply the glass in concrete. Uh, so this is the, that we are using that. We are working with the, the biggest plastic recycler. So one example is to is sorting and then using it in um, this white, uh, in this case, the for ground slabs, the recycle, um, the plastic, I, I'll finish off with um, the message. Uh, it's a very quick talk today, but um, I'm conscious about the time as well. Um, but I like to give liberty to ask, ask questions as well. But to find this. This came a long time back, one of the top fields in Melbourne. So I'll just not go through every detail. I'll show you a bit of plan view of the building. and. Uh, so the operational energy has to be calculated, embodied energy has to be uh, calculated. We did look at the two options, concrete and steel, and this is, will come in a big way, even when you select the structural system, when we select the materials, this quantification is a key. We'll take some informed decisions. And um, uh, yeah, uh, right. Then um, the um, total energy or the whole of life cycle, as I said, it's not 50 years now, we want to calculate for 100 years what happens. So then there'll be some challenges when you increase the life of the, the, the building. So we finally end up with this sort of calculation, concrete versus steel, embodied energy, uh, the carbon dioxide equivalence, embodied energy for the materials, operation energy, and to be calculated heating, in this case, cooling as well. Um, the heating is not necessary in Sri Lanka, obviously but the cooling component, then the equivalent tons of carbon dioxide. What is missing here is that construction time energy as well. As I mentioned, try to say today briefly, very quickly is to, we need to consider the construction processes, methods as well. What is the carbon being um, really consumed? I don't think we should go into that extent. I saw some calculations uh, in, in a construction site, they are even including the, the workers coming to work, how much carbon is used when, when they, when they, for their transport method coming to work. I don't think we need to really worry too much up to that level of calculation yet. Let's go step by step and work towards greening. Then, uh, no, uh, again, as I said, even at that time, it was very early when we started Green Building Council in 2009, but the, it's, um, uh, that now that's it, it's will become very hot. Things have changed. It, we'll see a lot more in the next few years. So this knowledge to have that um, knowledge is quite important. Look at how to calculate the uh, uh, the carbon dioxide um, uh, like equivalent value for a particular project. Considering all those aspects and then try to attack all that one by one. How to how do you reduce the carbon footprint? Those calculations have to be given for every project in Australia now, whether it's building or infrastructure. It's going to come to Sri Lanka and other countries as well. So it's really, and then we need to look at the what happens at the end of the life of the building. How do you, uh, which we call EOL, end of life, how do you really either reuse the materials or the components, or else even convert the materials into other ways? If you can't do all that, uh, we need to offset it by let's say growing, I mentioned a good example of hemp. And then also that sort of thing, you need to off offset uh, really the construction, the energy 
uh, the carbon dioxide. The other, then also use some innovative methods. Prefabrication is a key. Uh, and also I mentioned about robo-white type of innovative schemes. So um, yes, yeah, so I think I'll, I can talk for hours and hours. But rather than that, I think this is just a summary I want to give, but um, is any uh, really you not know, happy to uh, I'd hand over to, uh, to Sadipa uh, how you want to, uh, is there any some burning questions? I don't think we'll have time to answer every small question, but I'm happy to even through email answer some of them, but we try to uh, uh, hand over to Sadipa. Uh, okay, thank you very much, sir, for taking time from your busy schedule to be the resource person today's session. Uh, and your remarkable depth of understanding of the subject made the lecture on exceptionally stimulating and informative one. Thank you very much, uh, sir, again. And uh, as well as thank you all for being a great audience today. Uh, so uh, dear all, uh, let me give a few minutes to inform you regarding our uh, short, uh, our workshops and uh, training programs. Uh, so uh, uh, if you want to be a green accredited professional of the Green Green Council, this is the first step for that. You can uh, join our associate professional training program. It is registration is open now. You can apply for uh, it before 20th February. And, uh, and also we have designed a green associate professional international training program. Uh, uh, Actually, we mainly target uh, this, uh, for this uh, those who are in overseas. Uh, this program uh, will be conducted on online, and you can apply uh, this one too before twentieth uh, March. And and uh, this is uh, this is the second step uh, to become green accredited professional of the Green Green Council. So uh, this is advanced professional training program. Uh, it, it has designed for associate professional of the Green Building Council of Sri Lanka and lead APs and any other recognized green professional. Uh, its uh, registration is open now. You can apply it uh, before 20th February. Uh, and then uh, we move on our workshop. So this is our workshop on building life cycle assessment. Uh, this uh, this will be conducted on online uh, on 70th and uh, 80th of February. There is a limited number of seats for this, so register soon uh, before 15th of February. And uh, if you want to know more of a uh, workshop, short courses, and grand talks, and other our training programs, uh, please uh, mail us uh, our email address. Uh, uh, education.dbcslg at gmail.com and event.dbcsl at gmail.com and our contact number note double one two six seven nine one three zero and uh, you can uh, know more details our web, to our website to www.srilankagbc.org uh, so thank you very much for listening to me and uh, thank you very much sir again and all to stay tuned in our upcoming events too. Thank you all. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much again. Um, really a great start. And uh, uh, any questions? I know we didn't have time today, but uh, uh, anyone can really, uh, really, if the questions, I think, can email to Green Building Council. Is that Sadi possible? No, to really, and then you can forward that to me and happy to answer through email. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you.